Well, good morning, Cross Point Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody doing well? Man, it's good to see you here this morning. It's good to be back with you. We were out last week. and It's also good to worship with you this morning. How many of you are thankful for the worship this morning? Amen. And uh, Connor and the team did such a great job. You may have noticed Ryan is not here today. He took the day off, and uh, this past week he was at a scene conference, and he got finished with that and decided he was going to go down to Madison today to the campus. They are having a soft opening of a new-to-them facility that they are moving into this weekend today uh, and, and sort of running through all the systems because next week is our official launch into the new campus. And God is doing great things in Madison, Florida. Can we just thank God for that this morning? And uh, so proud of the Madison campus, proud of Pastor Darren and all that's going on down there. And God's just really uh, moving in a remarkable way. And so couldn't be more excited for them. I'm glad that Ryan got to be down there and just kind of see how things are going. He'll be back with us next week. But uh, as most of y'all know, Michael and I had an opportunity last week to be in Boston, Massachusetts on missions. We had an opportunity to lead a team up there together, 22 people that went up to serve with a church called Kings Hill Church, which is a partner church of ours in Boston, Massachusetts. And so we had an opportunity to go up there and lead a, a big team. We joined over 240 others while we were up there. So that's our group right there. And uh, praise God, amen. And so we all gathered up there on the streets of, of Boston and we began to go out and really just uh, do missions for uh, the, the church there, the ministry there is called The Big Move. And this morning, I want you to just imagine, if you will, because we didn't have any idea what we were getting into, okay? But I want you to just imagine, if you will, 300,000 college students and young adults all moving into their apartments in one day. Can you imagine such a thing? We couldn't either, Okay. It was total chaos in the city of Boston. Now, Boston's a big place. We didn't have an opportunity to minister to 300,000 people. I'm not saying that. But that was what was happening around the city all in one day. And so, as you can imagine, all the, the trans, uh, transient type of ways to move around the city were just clogged up and cars bumper to bumper everywhere you look and people moving into your homes. I want to give you a little bit of statistics, though, about our team because I tell you, it was one of the most fulfilling things that I've ever been a part of. And I say all this because I want you to be praying today about you going next year. It was truly incredible. But here's what our team did uh, on uh, September the 1st as we were helping students and young adults move into their apartments. We, um, on average, climbed, each one of us, over 300 flights of stairs. It's fun, right? You know, it was just incredible. We all averaged 25,000 steps. If you got an iPhone and you count your steps like me and Linnell, you would know how many steps you took. And, and I can tell you, we exceeded that amount, uh, 25,000 steps. And if, that, if you translate that into miles, each person that was up there, volunteers that went on this trip, walked over 10 miles on Sunday as we moved those students in. It was truly incredible. But here's the most incredible part of it all, is the conversations we had about Jesus Christ and what it means to belong to a local church. Amen? Uh, I tell you, we went to a city that doesn't know a lot about Jesus. And as we were on the city streets moving people in and, and just having conversations, we found it to be very surprising that so many people were very receptive to us helping them out, as you can imagine. They had five flights of stairs to climb to get to their apartment. They were like, yeah, you can help us. But uh, we were having these conversations with them, and it was so incredible because as we were being the hands and feet of Christ, we encountered some things that we just really didn't expect. Here's one of the most powerful. Somebody asked me, Pastor David, what is the most powerful thing you experienced while you were up there? And I said, it was this. When we were helping people move into their apartments and we told them we were with a local church 
and that we were doing this for free. We weren't asking for a handout or anything like that. And we were doing this because we love Jesus and we love people. Here's what people would say to us after we helped them move them in. They would say, I have a totally different perspective of Christianity than I had before. Isn't that amazing? They would say, I don't know, but I, I grew up in Boston, and my idea of what a Christian is is not what I see in y'all. They say things like, what I've always understood Christianity to be, this is something much different. And as I talked to the leadership of Kings Hill Church up there this past week, they were reporting to me that of the many people that we helped and the other churches helped as well, that those students and those young adults are already contacting them and saying, I want to learn more about what it means to belong to a local church. And some of them have even said, I want to learn what it means to be a believer and follower of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's in a city where less than 3% of the population believes in Christ. There are some uh, Islamic nations that have a higher percentage of, of, of Christians in their country than in the city of Boston. But one of the things that we recognized is that people were so thankful for what we were doing in their city. And so the church up there, Kings Hill, has already challenged us and the other churches that we're serving as well that they want to triple the number of volunteers that we have coming up next year. So I want you to begin praying today and even let me know today, if you will, uh, about going to Boston and helping us achieve the goals that they are setting for us as we go back. It was incredible. And so next year you will have an opportunity to go as well. As we get ready to pray and and move into the message day. I want us to specifically pray for Kings Hill Church. I want us to pray for Pastor Jonathan Mosley. He is the pastor there and the founder of that church and, and his leadership team. I tell you, they did an incredible job organizing everything and putting it up. And so we're going to pray for Kings Hill and them. And I also want to say this as I get ready to pray for us this morning. At the end of the service, I also want us to remember the unfortunate uh, circumstance that took place in North Georgia with the shooters going into the school I do want us to pray for that but I'm saving it for the end and you'll understand why when we get there okay but I want us to pray as a church for that I'm not leaving that out this morning but I want to begin this morning by just praying for Kings Hill and celebrating what God's doing in Boston and then we'll close the service praying for that other situation so let's pray together this morning Father we are so grateful God for all that you are doing in our life and God what a pleasure and an honor it is to just be able to serve you to be the hands and feet of Jesus to be able to go to a place that doesn't really know you and Lord to hear people say my perspective on Christianity has changed and even hearing those testimonies of people who say I want to know what it means to be a follower of Jesus God, thank you for those opportunities. And we pray, God, for the church there, Kings Hill, and all the church plants that are in Boston. We pray specifically for Pastor Jonathan Mosley and his wife, Chelsea, and all the leadership team there. God, that you would be with them and lead and guide them, that you would give them strength and the courage and the boldness to continue to preach the gospel, Lord, to a city that desperately needs to hear it. And Father, we thank you for what you're doing in this place. We thank you for the life change. We thank you for, uh, Lord, just knowing you in such a way that we can be encouraged by your presence in our life, that we can be moved and challenged to, to, to flee from sin in our life and to pursue the righteousness of Jesus. God, we love you so much. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word, God, that we have an opportunity to study together. And, Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we're kicking off a new series called Empowered. You probably guessed that by the video that we just showed, but we're talking about what it means to be empowered. And I love the definition of this word. I don't know that I really had ever really studied the definition, how you would define it. There were several different ways that I found that it is defined, but as it relates to people, this is the definition that I I found and I really like, it says this, to be empowered is to make someone stronger 
and more confident, especially as it relates to their life. And so this morning we are kicking off a series where we are talking about being empowered, but we're not talking about being empowered by our own gifts, but rather being empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. You see, Jesus, and he was pouring into his disciples, and John records this in John chapter 16, Jesus begins to help his disciples understand what it means to live a life in the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. You know, we are very much aware that in this last few weeks that we have been studying through John chapter 14 and 15, that Jesus has been preparing his disciples for a time when he would depart from this earth and he would take his rightful place at the right hand of the Father. We know, because we've read the gospel, that he's going to go to the cross, and it's on the cross that he's going to die for the atonement of our sins, not his own, and he'll be taken down from that cross, he'll be buried in a tomb, and in three days he'll have victory over sin and death by being raised from the grave. And we know that our Savior lives, amen? So we know all that, but at this point in his disciples' life, they don't. They don't understand all that. They're not sure what's really happening. All they know is that Jesus has been talking to them about departing. And they've been following Jesus for three years. They are beginning to understand that there is something going on, but here's the truth of the matter. They don't like what they hear. They don't like the fact that Jesus is getting ready to leave. And the reason for that is because they're very concerned about how life is going to continue, how life is going to go on once Jesus departs. And so there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of things that you're dealing with as just true followers of Christ. But Jesus is preparing them. And so in John chapter 16, what he's going to do is he's going to move into this time of really helping them to understand what the Holy, who the Holy Spirit is and what his role is in their life. He's going to be sharing with them all aspects of the Holy Spirit, and he is going to provide for them sort of this theological lens in which they can view the Holy Spirit and truly understand who Jesus himself has identified as a helper, how, what that's going to mean for them as he comes into their life. And so here's what we're going to learn in this series. We're going to learn that the Holy Spirit is the divine spark that ignites our faith. He is the one who empowers us to service. And the Holy Spirit is one who transforms our life as believers and followers of Christ Jesus. And so I'm excited about this series. I hope that you are as well. So let me invite you to turn with me, if you haven't already, to John chapter 16. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7, and I want to offer to you the context of what Jesus is presenting to them. You know, Jesus, like I said, he's aware, very much aware of what they're feeling, what they're experiencing, what they're sort of going through as he is, is teaching them. And because of this, what we're going to see here in the first seven verses are really the distress of Jesus' departure. We're going to see that Jesus' departure, all that he's been talking about, is that in which it really concerns them. And what Jesus is going to do is he is going to present to them there's no reason to be concerned because he is sending the helper, the Holy Spirit. He's sending the Holy Spirit to take up residence within their life and to be their helper as they live out their life. And so that's what we're going to be looking at here. Now, if you remember, we left off with Jesus really meeting with them in those last hours before he was crucified. He had promised him that, that upon his departure, he would send this helper. And what Jesus is going to do is he is going to offer through this promise a level of comfort to them and direction for his disciples. Now, here's what's so important as we read this story about them is this is also relevant for us, amen? Because as believers, the same truths that hold true for them are the same truths that we can apply to our life as well. So we're not just merely learning 
about their life and what happened in their life, a narrative, so to speak, but we're also learning biblical truths, real biblical truth that we can apply to our own life as we try to live out our life in situations that are often stressful for us. Amen? And so what a powerful passage that we have to look at here this morning. So read with me, if you will, John 16, starting with verse 1, and it says this. Jesus says, I have said all of these things to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. Now, let me stop right there for just a moment. What's really interesting about what Jesus has just said is that he has already explained to them that he is going to be departing. And no doubt that has caused great distress in their life, right? They're, un- they're concerned. They don't know what's happening. They're, they're uncertain about the future. They don't even know if they can go on because for, for three years they have been following Jesus. They have been very faithful to him. He is their faithful leader. He has been leading and guiding them. And, and, and there's no doubt in their life they are wondering what they're going to do when he goes. How hard will it be? Will we make it? Will we fall away? Jesus says, I, I've said these things that you may not fall away. Will, will they fall away from their faith? They, they don't know what to expect. And now all of a sudden, Jesus says, I know that's concerning to you, but there's more that you need to be prepared for because you see what's going to happen is persecution is going to come. Not only will you just be uncertain about the direction you need to go, but you're also going to face excommunication. When they realize that you guys are followers of me because of what's going to happen, when they realize that you are followers of Christ, they're going to put you out of the synagogue. And then he goes even further than that, and he goes, and when they come to kill you. Now, I'm probably thinking at this point they're going, wait a minute, what did we sign up for, right? Right? What do you mean kill us? You know, he says, when they come and they kill you, here's what's so ironic about that is that they think they are doing it all for the service of God. They will think they're killing you to do a good service to God. How ironic. But he says, you know what? They don't know the Father. They just think they do. And they certainly don't know me or they would be following me. And so Jesus is gone from bad to worse. I'm leaving, I'm departing. And he says, and it could get even worse than anything you could imagine. But you see, this is where Jesus offers them the promise that they find to be very comforting. Read this with me, verse 4 and following. He says, but I've said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you but now I'm going to him who sent me remember that's the father the father sent his only begotten son right that he would come that he would surrender his life on the cross for our sins so he's referencing the father here and he says I'm going back to the father who sent me and none of you ask me where are you going But because I have said these things to you, look at this. This is powerful. Jesus recognizing this about his disciples. He says, because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. What's really interesting about Jesus is he knows everything about us. Amen. He already knows what's going on in our life. He knows what's going on in the disciples. He can see it in their eyes. He can sense it. But he can understand it better than they can understand it. And he says, your hearts are filled with sorrow. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. And I love this. He says, I tell you the truth. In other words, what Jesus says is, what I'm about to tell you, you can 
you can hang your hat on, right? You can count on it. You can embrace it. You can believe it. You can hang on to it because what I'm about to tell you is the truth that you need to hear as I prepare to depart and the world prepares to persecute you. If there was anything that you need to take away from, from what I'm telling you, this is it. This is the truth I want to present to you. It is to your advantage, Jesus says, that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. You know, it's amazing to me how often in life we are in need of help outside of our own capabilities have you ever noticed that there are so many times in our life where the need arises that we could really use some help so many opportunities so many circumstances in our life where we really need some help you know what we're really good at we're really good at rejecting that help you know what i'm talking about somebody comes up and says hey can i help you with that no i got it have you ever said that to anybody when you know in your heart, man, it sure would be good. It's kind of like, you know, if you'd let your yes be yes and your no be no, then we would understand what's going on. But somehow when you answer, no, I got it, we're supposed to read your mind that, no, you don't got it. We got, we, you know what I'm saying? So often we're really good at just rejecting the help that comes to us when we, in fact, need it because it is so far beyond our own capabilities. We're just really good at that. So often we need help help while we were in boston this week i can't tell you how many times that happened in fact the very first couple that we went up to uh, it wasn't a couple it was a mother and her her daughter who was going to college it was me and Linnell and bill henderson and chris plymel and the four of us we approached them and and it was obvious they needed help. They had their SUV was open, and it was just packed full of boxes. And there were some big boxes in there. And we looked, and we walked up, and we introduced ourselves. We said, hey, we're here to help. We're with Kings Hill Church. We're just out on the streets volunteering. We just want to help people move in. And, and so how could we help? Can we, can we help you get your stuff up to your, to your apartment? And the mother immediately said, she said, no, we got it. We just kind of looked inside the SUV, we, you know, and the daughter, she said, Mom, let them help. Now, here's the thing. As we approached the car, we already knew they were in trouble, right? It looked like they had been arguing for at least a good 30 minutes about this problem that they had. And so we said, Ma'am, please let us help you. And the, the mother, once again, she said, No, we got it. I promise you. Y'all can move on. We've got it. And the daughter said, We don't got it. Okay? We need help. Let them help you. No, we're good. No, we're not good. Yes, we're good. No, we're not good. I mean, this went on for, you know, and, and finally, I'm looking at the mom, and you could just see the fear on her face. And so I stepped in and I said, Ma'am, please let us help you. And she looked at us and she said, okay, fine. So immediately, Bill Henderson, he moves in, he grabs the first box, and he goes, hmm, yeah. And we knew immediately why there was so much stress in her life at this moment. Bill Henderson, he looks back over at me, he says, David, this thing's heavy. And uh, he, he slid the box out a little bit. It was only about this big and a, about four feet long. But, I mean, you know, it, it, he said, this I said, well, here, pull it out and throw it up on my shoulder, and I'll carry it in. And he goes, I don't think you understand. This box ain't going on anybody's shoulder. And so I said, well, spin it around. And I grab this side, and we lift. And I said, my goodness, this is quality furniture. <laughs> you ever picked up? I mean, it was like. It was like we picked it up, and I said, what is this built out of repurposed anvils? I mean, what, what on earth could be in such a small box and weigh 100 pounds? And I said, what floor? we got to get there as quickly as possible, right? And she said, well, it's 327 on the fourth floor. You see, in Boston, I don't know why they do this, but the first floor... Uh, it begins at the second floor. You know, the, the one-owed numbers are at the... And so it's four floors 
uh, four flights uh, stories high, and she says it's at the end of the hall. It wasn't even at the close of the landing. I mean, it was all the way at the... And so up we go, and I don't know how long it took us to get that box up to that room, but we finally got there. We set it down. We were drenched in sweat, and, and Bill looks at me. He goes, we've got five more to go. <laughs> I said, no, we don't, Bill. I'm praying for that woman, and I'm getting out. No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I said, I said, no, we don't, Bill. We've got all day of this. This is the first one. But she knew she needed help, but she was willing to reject it. I don't know what they would have done. We finally got them unloaded, and she couldn't have thanked us but a thousand times. The title that Jesus gives the Holy Spirit is the helper. I want you to think about that for just a moment. Allow that to sink in here this morning. The, 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 the designation that Jesus gives to his disciples as he is providing this theological lens for the disciples to look to, through and to understand who the Holy Spirit is, he gives them this designation, this title of the helper, and it couldn't be more appropriate for what the Holy Spirit is to us. And yet every single day of our life, we live our life as though we don't need His help. Every single day of our life, we get up in the morning, we charge out the door, we never really thank God for the day, the air we breathe, we, we leave this place and we, we don't depend on the Holy Spirit who has been sent to us. You see, what the Bible teaches is that if you are here today as a child of God, if you've been saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus, then the Holy Spirit resides within you. Amen? He resides within you. The helper that was sent for the disciples is the same helper that you and I have, the divine helper that we have been given as one of the greatest gifts to help us and to guide us and to give us direction and to give us strength and even to empower us to live out our life. And so here we see that Jesus would offer this title and his words, they, they present a reality to the disciples that quite honestly, they're just not ready for. That they need his help. You see, Jesus says, I'm leaving, and I know you're distressed. I'm leaving, and this life is going to get difficult. But I'm going to send you, I promise, I'm going to send you. In fact, you're going to be better off when I go, because I am going to send to you the helper. Look at verse 5 and 6 with me. So here we read where it says in verse 5, he says, but now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, look at this, sorrow has filled your heart. The reality is most of us in this room have probably already lived long enough to realize there are circumstances that spring up in life that when we begin to dwell on them, when we begin to focus on them, when we allow those circumstances to consume us, sorrow begins to fill our hearts as well. Amen? It might be the grief that we have over someone we love. It could be a financial situation. It could be moving the stuff out of your car four flights of stairs. I don't know. There are just circumstances that come around ever so often in our life. And as we go through those moments, we find, suddenly find ourselves filled with sorrow. And so Jesus recognizes this about his disciples. Jesus says, our time together is coming to a close. He says to them, this is about to end, and they can't imagine life without Jesus. And so what Jesus does, he comforts them. He reassures them with a promise, a promise of a Holy Spirit who is the helper. He says this in verse 7, 
Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is your advantage, to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So let me ask you a question. Why is it so important for you and I to look through that theological lens this morning and understand the benefits of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Why is it so important that we would get it? That we would understand that God lives within us as believers and that we don't need to reject His help, but rather we need to depend on His help day by day. What is it about the Holy Spirit in our life that we need to learn today? What is it about the Holy Spirit in our life that we need to embrace in our life? I want to give you three things about the Holy Spirit the first one is this the Holy Spirit is our teacher he is our teacher over the years and I've lived longer than some of you in this room not all of you some of you are much much older than I am I must add but I've lived longer than some of you and I've had a lot of teachers in my life many of which were When I was in school, but over the years, I've had Bible teachers. I've had different people that have taught me, and I I love a good teacher, right? Someone who teaches me, and I've been educated by teachers. I've learned from teachers. I love teachers, right? And so we've all had people who have taught us one thing or another throughout the years. We've had mentors, right? We've had those people in our life who have discipled us and mentored us, and they mean so much to us because you Usually there's a relationship involved there, and we learn so much from the people who are teaching and mentoring us. We've also had coaches in our life, at least if you've played sports or things like that. You've had people who have coached you. It might have been Little League back in the day, or it might have been later in life, but we've had coaches. And all of these people, they mean something to us, don't they? They mean something because they've made a tremendous impact on our life. But let me just say this, none has made the impact on our life that the Holy Spirit can make in our life. You see, the work of the Holy Spirit as our teacher, that work is transformative. It is something that takes a life and it transforms it into another life, right? We may learn from our teachers, our mentors, and even our coaches, but we are transformed by the teacher that we have in the Holy Spirit. I love what we read about this uh, in, uh, in chapter 14, verse 26, a couple of chapters back, we read where Jesus, he introduced the Holy Spirit to the disciples. He says, but the helper, and then he says, the Holy Spirit, in case you're wondering, Uh, where you're looking at our passage today you say well I don't see the Holy Spirit there is the helper could it mean somebody else no it doesn't Jesus when he refers to him back in chapter 14 he says the helper comma the Holy Spirit right He, he wants you to know the helper he's talking about is the Holy Spirit of God he says but the helper the Holy Spirit whom the father will send in my name look at this he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. You see, in our walk with God, the Holy Spirit illuminates the Scripture. Have you ever been reading through the Bible? You come across one of those stories, you've read it 10, 20, 30, 100 times, you know, in the course of reading your Bible. You've read this story, you heard about it when you were a kid, you learned about it in youth ministry, you've, you've continued to read it over the years, And you're reading it on this particular day, and then all of a sudden something just stands out that's much different. You you know what I'm talking about? The the Scripture just comes alive. The Word of God just comes alive. And as you see that, you begin to notice, man, this is a gold nugget that I've received. I mean, it's just profound. You've always read it as though it was a narrative of somebody else's story, but the reality is you begin to realize that this is applicable to you, and it just comes alive, and it begins to teach you, and you begin to understand it. My friends, that is the work of the Holy Spirit teaching you in your life it's a powerful experience only 13 of you have ever experienced it apparently because you're not praising God this morning but the reality is that is a powerful moment in which the Holy Spirit comes alive 
in our life. That's living in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen? There's another thing that the Holy Spirit is. He's also our counselor. He's our counselor. Now, when we talk about counselor, I'm not talking about the guy who just, uh, you know, showers you with encouragement to, to lift you up. I'm talking about someone who often tells you the things that you find most uncomfortable. I'm talking about accountability, right? I'm talking about the, the Holy Spirit being that one who is more of a convictor of things that you need convicting over. And so what we begin to see is the role of the Holy Spirit is the role of a counselor, and he offers us truth even when that truth might be uncomfortable. In verse 8, we'll look at this more deeply next week. We didn't read it earlier. We stopped at 7, but in verse 8, this is what Jesus would say about the Holy Spirit. He would say, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. What does he mean by that? You know what's so powerful about that is he says when, when, the, Holy Spirit, when, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, there'll be, there'll be moments in your life where he is convicting you of your sin. There'll also be moments in his life where he is encouraging you as he, as he counsels you on the righteousness of Christ. But there are times in our life where we feel that conviction when we find ourselves in sin. And the Holy Spirit reveals that sin in our life so we can bring about change in our life. You may have heard me say before, I've said it several times before, I welcome conviction. Not because I enjoy the sin that I have found myself committing, but rather I welcome the conviction because I recognize it as the presence of God in my life. You see, there's nothing more assuring to me of my salvation than when I feel conviction of the Holy Spirit because I know that what the Holy Spirit is doing is He is trying to get me to adjust my pursuits toward righteousness and not toward the things that I am sinning in. And so he turns me away from sin. This is the role of the Holy Spirit as counselor, and he helps me set me on a path of righteousness. And I love that. I love it. I don't love the sin that I've been found out in, right? The Holy Spirit knowing and convicting me of the sin, but I love the fact that he loves me enough to correct me and to put me on the right path and to pursue the holiness of God. I love that. And so this is what we see and understand about the Holy Spirit. But we also finally see the Holy Spirit as our comforter. Now, I'm not talking about a down comforter, okay? I know that some of you immediately went to a down comforter. My wife would do that because she likes to turn the air down at night to about 55, and my teeth are chattering, and I have to pull about six comforters up over my, my, my face just to stay warm, right? She likes it really cold. But I'm not talking about that, but I am talking about in times of suffering, in times of pain, in times of grief, in times of uncertainty, much like what the disciples are facing here in this text, we see the role of the Holy Spirit as one who comforts us. It's really powerful to think about. And in fact, remember the whole reason why Jesus is shared with the disciples that he is sending the Holy Spirit to begin with is why? Because he's seen sorrow in their hearts. You see, he knows exactly where they are. He understands that there are a lot of concerns that they have. And even now, as he has shared that the worst is yet to come to his disciples, he knows what they're feeling. He knows that what they need more than anything else in this world is comforting. In the presence of the Holy Spirit, he says, I'm going to leave, I'm going to depart, but it's going to benefit you that I leave because when I leave, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send the one who is going to dwell in you with forever and in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he's going to always be there to comfort you in the midst of everything that brings you sorrow. What a powerful thing to understand about the Holy Spirit. You see, in Romans 
chapter 8 verse 26 we see this likewise the spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know what to pray for as we ought but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words have you ever felt weak you know I was thinking about that passage that verse and I was thinking about my life and I think I feel weakness more than I feel strength on a daily basis. I usually, what I focus on is my, my inadequacies, you know, my insecurities. Anybody like that in here? Or are you just a narcissist and you think you're perfect? No, I'm kidding. No, we, we, we do, don't we? We so often, we just focus on our failures. I'm such a loser. I'm such a failure. I, you know, I, I, we feel weak so often, but we don't have to feel weak because what Jesus has promised not only his disciples but us as believers and followers in Christ is that he is going to send one to comfort us in those moments of weakness. When we are weak, he is strong. Amen? And so here we see that he has given to us that in, as we face troubles and sorrows, the Holy Spirit is there to comfort, to intercede, to help us in our weakness. So this morning as we close out this, this message, the question that I, I sort of wrestle with is, so how do we live empowered? How do we, how do we live out our life on a daily basis empowered by the Holy Spirit? How do we live out our life in such a way that we don't feel as though we're living our life in weakness, but we feel empowered, not in self-confidence, but in the confidence that we have in the Spirit of God who takes up a dwelling place within us. Amen? How do we live like that? If we struggle with it, maybe we're not so good at it, but, but I think we can be. I think that the Word of God teaches us to rely on the Holy Spirit in a way that we can live that life empowered. What do we say empowered means? Strengthened and made more confident, especially as it relates to life. To live in the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. I want to give you two ways I feel like we can do that. Two ways how we can ensure that this is happening in our life. That we are living that empowered life in the Holy Spirit. The first one is this. Daily devotion to the Spirit. You know, so often when I wake up in the morning, I roll out of bed, and I wake up pretty quick. I don't, I'm not one of these that bumps into everything going to the coffee pot. I, I, I pretty much wake up, eyes wide open. Another day, I'm alive, right? I get up out of bed, and usually I start thanking God for yet another day. I start praying. I thank God for sending His Son, Jesus, because without Jesus, I wouldn't have forgiveness or atonement of sin. I thank God for His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness. I, I, I usually start off like that. I pray and I ask God to not lead me into temptation, but deliver me for, from evil. I don't know what your prayer life looks like in the morning. I hope you do pray, but I, my mind is on the things of God, and I, I typically find myself thanking the Father, thanking the Son. But what I don't typically do, and I don't know why, but in my prayer, I don't typically say, and God, I am so weak, and so I am relying on the Holy Spirit today as my helper. Oftentimes, I don't even acknowledge it. A daily devotion to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. A daily devotion to the person of the Holy Spirit Whereas I think about leaving the house, as I think about what my day entails, that I'm depending on the Holy Spirit to lead and guide me and direct me to be my comforter, to be the strength that I need when I feel weak, to empower me to get through 
whatever it is that the day holds for me, good and bad, to really rely on the Holy Spirit. And I'm just being transparent with you. I kind of imagine you find yourself in the same place I do a lot of times. Maybe because we don't look through that theological lens at who really the Holy Spirit is. And the way I see it is that Jesus provided this lens for us to really examine the Holy Spirit and to understand the benefits of the Holy Spirit that maybe we should. <laughs> maybe we should. In fact, he devotes, John devotes an entire chapter, chapter 16, where he talks about being empowered by the Holy Spirit. Here's the last thing I want to give you. We're almost done, but... You don't have a service coming behind you, so I could hold you for a while. No, you just get up and walk out, I guess. This last one's really good, though. Not only do we need a daily devotion to the Holy Spirit, we need to cultivate the fruits of the Spirit. We need to cultivate the fruits of the Spirit. You see, Paul, when he was writing to the Galatians, he... He laid out this list for us. He calls it the fruits of the Spirit. And what it really is, is it's the, it's the evidences of our salvation. Paul says, if you're truly a child of God, then when people look into your life, these are the things that they will see, right? These are the things that will be the fruit of your salvation, the fruit of the Spirit of God who dwells within you. And he lays out a whole list of them. It's not that this is a comprehensive list, but it's a pretty long list. And this is what he says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such things there is no law. Of all those things that I just mentioned to you, how many of those do you struggle with? You see, there's a need in our life to cultivate these things, these fruits of the Spirit. If, if the Word of God would say, this is the evidence of your salvation, and we struggle with loving people, then don't you think we maybe should cultivate love in our hearts? Try and discipline ourselves to try and be more loving when love seems to be absent? If self-control is one of those things that we really struggle with, don't you think that maybe we should try to cultivate those things? Because these are truly the evidences of our salvation. This is what the Holy Spirit of God wants to do in our life, that we may be seen in the image of Christ. That we may be seen in the image of Christ. That when people look into our life, what they see is not someone who's living in the flesh like we used to, but rather someone who looks an awful lot like Jesus. Amen? I said earlier, one of the greatest things that happened on that trip to Boston is as we are doing the work of Jesus, we're testifying about the benefits of belonging to a local church. We're telling people about the love of Christ and how Christ has transformed our life, and that's what brought us to Boston to begin with. As we share all of that to see the work of the Holy Spirit as people who had already confessed that they didn't believe in Jesus, who already confessed that they don't go to church, by the time you leave, they not only offer you a Gatorade, which you desperately needed, but they say something to you like this. Hey, before you leave, I just want you to know my perception of Christianity has changed because of you. I don't say that to boast because Lord knows I struggle with all of those things. I say that to say that is the power of the Holy Spirit at work, not only in my life, but in the life of those who yet are yet to know him. I love that, y'all. 
I want to know more about what it means to live in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen? I think it benefits us all. And so in just a moment, we're going to pray. I said at the beginning of the service, I want to pray this morning for those whose families grieve because a few days ago a gunman walked into a middle school and killed some folks, shot up some others. This happens in our world today. But this time it happened a little close, closer to home. Amen? And as I think about that, I, I don't know about you, but I was just brought to tears. A middle school. And yet it, it isn't about our view of politics. It's about just what's happening in our world today and, and about us having compassion for families who have lost people who they love. And so this morning as we close out the service, I want to invite you, if you feel led to do so, I just want to invite every one of us in here. I know this, that's a lot of people, but I just want to invite you to come to this altar this morning and pray. Pray for those families. Pray for our country. Pray that the, the evil in this world would be stopped by the light of this world. Amen. Jesus Christ. That we would see change in our world because the church steps up and begins first by praying, but also be in the hands and feet of Christ. And taking a gospel message, which is where our hope lies. Amen taking the gospel message to a world that's lost and in desperate need of Jesus. Let us be faithful to the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Let us pray. When we can do nothing else, let us pray. If you're here this morning and maybe you want to come to this altar and you want to pray because as you've listened to this message, you've, you've begun to realize, you know, there's a, there's a lot that I need help with and the one to help me more than anything in this world is the helper. The helper who Jesus has already let us know is the Holy Spirit in our life. So maybe you'll come and ask the Holy Spirit to move in your life in such a way to help you with the things that you need change in. Or maybe today the Holy Spirit has been drawing you near. And you realize that today is the day of salvation. Our pastors will be down front. I'm down here. If you want to come and speak to us about salvation, we'll try to answer the questions that you have and help you understand how you can surrender your life to Christ. Because as much as we have talked about the benefits of the Holy Spirit of God, you will not reap those benefits outside of salvation. Amen? So whatever... You, God has laid on your heart whatever he's called you to do. May you be faithful to respond. Let's pray.